Sound Archive bringing an exclusive YouTube interview with two members of Black Tape for a Blue Girl. I have with me two former guests on the podcast, Oscar Herrera, Sam Rosenthal, both here. How are you gentlemen doing this evening? Good, good. Looking forward to this. Great. Thanks for doing it. Absolutely. It's great to have you both back. I felt like we just spoke not long ago. Two great, wonderful interviews. And for today's exclusive, we're going to talk about an album that is going to be remastered and put out on vinyl for the first time, A Chaos of Desire, where Sam, you are launching a Kickstarter very soon to get this record out there on vinyl. So that's our topic. That's what we're going to be getting into today. A lot to get it to with that album. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much for doing it. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about how that even came about getting it on vinyl. What is it about vinyl? I know you have other albums that you've done a Kickstarter for that you got pressed on vinyl. What is it about chaos of desire for this to be the next project that you kickstart for? Um, Black Tape for Blue Girl has reissued two of our earlier albums on vinyl. Um, the Cast of Desire is the fourth album from 1991 and the fourth one that Oscar sang on. And the first, it's been out of print for, I think, 15 years on CD now. It's been not physical for such a long time. And it, I think it's a really cohesive album and it will sound really nice in the format of vinyl. It splits really well into the four sides. So it's also a chance to remaster the album. It's from 91 and I, I'll go into the issues I had with the, my ability to mix the album at the time, but the, it was mastered in LA in the early nineties when I think Bright and A Little Shrill was a very popular style to cut through. And so I think, as you heard, the remaster sort of warms up the album and it definitely makes it more listenable. So it comes out really nice. Oscar, have you heard the any of the remastered version yet? Yes, I did. Uh, Sam sent it to me. Yeah, it does sound, sound very good. And uh, it's interesting to listen to some of the stuff because you kind of forget about it and then you listen to it and say, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I remember this. I remember this. Yeah, it, it sounds really nice. Yeah. And just speaking about the memory and kind of going back to putting it all together, Sam, I'll kind of start with you because, you know, it's your main project black tape for a blue girl so what do you remember of the recording of that album kind of getting all the players on the board to put it into motion kind of take us back to that time yeah so i had to sort of dig through my old cassettes to remember the sequence of things and it started in like april of 1989 and was recording over about a year and i think to me the main thing i remember is sort of the angst I felt at the time and the unhappiness with relationships which sort of poured into the lyrics and then over time it's almost like my brain just deleted everything because it just I was just getting out of college trying to get a job it just felt like such a miserable time I think so to me the music sort of has this personality from that period that is the main thing I remember from then not the events of recording it. Um, Juliana, who sings lead on two songs, came in from Tucson. Vicky in Miami plays on it. And it's hard to really picture much about the actual process now. I know I recorded on a half inch eight track. I know I mixed it through a really old Tapco board that I think Oscar saw later, because I think I eventually bought that board. But it's, it's really hard to really piece together the events of the recording of the album. And Oscar, you being in Miami, and Sam, at this point, you have already you had already moved out west to California, right? Yeah, yeah. I I've been I moved out in '86, so this was like yeah. four years out there. So, how did you kind of bring everyone together to get their parts on the album? Well, back then, I would mail a cassette, right, Oscar, that had yeah. songs, yeah. and me poorly singing them as a guide for what I wanted Oscar to do. And 
I, I've always loved Oscar's voice, and I just knew what Oscar could do with a song. So I think there were little things I would do that said, okay, do this kind of thing here. But Oscar really then took that and practiced with that to then record it in the studio. That was always my favorite challenge. <laughs> Taking taking what he was singing and figuring out the melody and figuring out what he wanted to do with it and and then you know taking it from there. But the guide tracks were always perfect. I mean, they were always good enough and close enough that I knew which way you wanted to go. It would be interesting at some point to hear those guide tracks, you know, and hear oh, hear, oh, no. Sam, hear do Sam do on think, vocals. Do you think Sancho will you release that stuff? I have ideas about not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> I think on the, on the Patreon, occasionally I'll put up something when I find a guide vocal and it's like, warning, you are going to hear me singing now. And and you can hear, oh, and then look what Oscar did with that idea. You know, look how he interpreted that and made it sound <laughs> really great, you know. Yeah. But I don't think you want to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of do. <laughs> I kind of do. <laughs> so talk about some of the other participants on the album because what a lush sound that record has you know strings and uh I, I hear other i don't know maybe i'm just hearing things but i hear brass on that record too i don't know and is, is, is there brass on that album well it's my emacs horn sound ah so, okay um it's an illusion of brass <laughs> yeah and when i was a couple of the songs i did new mixes of that are going to be part of the bonus on digital. And I had to go in and replay like the horn on, I guess, Hypocrite is Me or something. It was it was too mm. mush to go back to the mix. Mm. And I'm like, yeah, I still have that horn sound, so I can actually still play that sound and figure out what I played. But um, the violinist, especially in like Beneath the Icy Flow and we watched our Saturday Angel Fall and the Hypocrite is Me is Vicki Richards, who I met through an artist named Slap who was in Miami and she played on a couple tracks on his records. And I honestly don't remember how we got in touch. She had some of her own music first. And so she played on maybe three or four of the albums and I recorded with her down in Miami. And then Jana plays some violin sort of Vicky's in the middle of the album and Jana's sort of around on the outside, like Pandora's box. Um, and on, could I say the honest one? And she was in a band I knew in Orange County called The Black Watch. And now she actually is Rod Stewart's violinist. So she's been touring oh. for like 20 years or something. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And then Juliana had a band called Skinner Box. I have visual aid, her album, Skinner, oh, Glare, Skinner Box. And she had, that album was the only one that was out, I think, when we first got in touch. Mm. And it was probably because I was doing my mail order catalog. And she probably sent it to me to sell through the catalog. And so... Sue Kenny Smith, who sang on the previous two albums, lived in England, and it wasn't going to be really, it wasn't, I don't know, we lost touch or whatever. So I asked Jenna if she would sing on the record. And I think Jenna and Oscar's voice, they're more similar in a way than Sue Kenny Smith's and Oscar's voice. So I think they really work together well on the album. When you're singing backing for Juliana or she was singing backing for you, the mesh of the two voices was really nice together. And... Uh, Melinda Matthews plays clarinet, I think, on two tracks, but there's maybe one other person, but there wasn't a lot of different musicians on it. And Oscar, how did you feel that partnership with the other musicians and the, and the other singer? How do you feel that kind of meshed together for you? Um, I mean, with every recording that we've ever done, it's it's never been that we've been in the same room, so it's Sometimes it was someone who recorded in a different city, most of the time in a different city. Mm -hmm. So it would me be me trying to pretend that I'm singing backup or answering a phrase that someone else had already recorded and pretending and trying to feel what it's like if that person were in the room. But we never did anything where it was two of us, you know, singing in the same room. Um, but I think, you know, the, the voices blended well. Um, and I've always been pleased with, if I was a lead singer on a track, you know, with the, the, the vocals that were answering or singing along with or you know responding to whatever i was doing um that that always worked really well i mean the feel of it was that people were together in a room but it never was the case it was always sam and me or sam and whoever else was there. 
And you and Sam go back way to the early 80s, right? Sam, you were seeing Oscar and Sleep of Reason, right, back at that time, and then you later put him on your zine. Is that how you all kind of got connected? That's right, Oscar. Was that 84 when I saw you guys play outdoors? It was 84. It, yeah. was, a, it was an outdoor event. I think the Bobs were playing too, and uh, I forgot who else. Um, yeah, he had the zine, and then he came out to see us, and uh, you co-wrote that article with Bob Slade, right? <laughs> I would have to look. I'd That's what it says in the credits. I don't, it I don't says his name, and then with, with, with Sam, so I think he wrote most of it. Yeah, and so I had, um, I was doing electronic music, instrumental stuff at that time, and the last cassette before I moved to California, I decided to have lyrics on it, and Oscar was the first person I wanted to sing. And so I was really happy that you wanted to sing on that. That was and Islands. I, Islands, right? On Islands. Islands. Yeah. Yeah. And then I was I was trying to remember when when we recorded later Chaos and Desire, which of your bands was going right then? At the, I was between bands, actually. The Sleeper Reason had broken up in 85. And it wasn't until 90 that I had another band. So oh, okay. Yeah. So, so when first... we, in 89, I wasn't in any band. So the first four black tape, then you weren't, you were between Florida bands. Correct. Mm. So the Sleeper Reason had just broken up. We recorded the rope, and I guess there were four albums before uh, Picasso Trigger, which later became Halo, which was 90. Yeah, and then th this album, it got finished in 90. I mixed it in May and June, but it didn't come out until 91. Yeah, so that, by that point, I was already with Picasso Trigger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I guess... When I when I moved to California and I was writing lyrics, I was like, who who can sing these the way I wish I could sing these? And Oscar immediately was the person I asked because I'm not a singer. I write the melodies, but I, you know, I, I could write songs that were more dramatic, had more range because I knew Oscar could do that. So it was always in mind that that's who I wanted to sing what I was going to write. And Oscar kind of this opportunity that can, kind of came to do another black tape record. How were you feeling about that? Considering you were in between projects, were you looking forward to it, or was it yeah, just I was something? Always looking forward to. Yeah. I mean, I was always thankful that that Sam involved me because it meant I was still doing something musical, even though I wasn't playing live and I didn't have my own band. I was still doing something musical and something that I could say, "Hey, look, I'm on this recording. I'm on this release." So that was that was always good. Was there ever a tour at all for Chaos of Desire or any shows that you may have played together for that one? There no. was, yeah, we didn't play until 96, live. The yeah, I, I remember for the Project Fest, when, did you play any songs off that record at that show? There was a Chain of Colors, which what's really struck me at that festival is I, I remember seeing two or three guys in the front mouthing i mean singing along to every word on that song and I, you know because it was it's a very emotional song and, and i said wow this is really cool these people have, i mean they've been listening to well if the album came out in 95 uh, six 91. years before they finally or 91 five years before they finally saw you know us playing it live and they knew that song so i, I thought it was re very moving to see that and we probably did pandora's box at one of the two festivals i, I believe yeah, yeah. but i'm not sure which one. And I, I was just saying to Oscar by email recently that if we had lived in the same city during those four years, I mean, if you weren't with one of your own bands, I assume we would have figured out a way to play live being together. Yeah, well, I mean, if we if we had been living in the same city, that probably would have been the band I was in. I wouldn't have <laughs> started another band. <laughs> True. I would have been the band. Yeah. But would've I would, been, yeah. at that time, I would fly back to Florida to record and then the next album, Oscar flew out to LA to record. Yeah, yeah, that one I remember well because it was, I think, right after Hurricane Andrew in '92. <laughs> what do you remember from the conversations you two had when Oscar was sending back and forth the cassette? Because obviously, it's not real time, right? So, thinking about that time did you have any conversations where maybe sam it wasn't exactly what you had in mind or there were some adjustments that you wanted to make do you remember any of those types of conversations to kind of kind of calibrate on what you were getting from oscar well 
it was only one cassette to Oscar, and then I came to the studio to record. Oh, wow. And okay. so, so Oscar had it, learned it, and then sort of figured out things. I mean, now looking back on myself, I see I had insecurities about telling Oscar what I wanted, even though I know I did. But Oscar was in a band. He knew what he was doing, and I felt like I was telling somebody who knew what they were doing to do things differently at times. And it, you know, caused my own complexes about that kind of thing. But I do think that a lot of what Oscar did, I mean, a lot of the songs you did straight through one take or two, you know, second recording, first recording, because you just, you knew the song, you knew what to do. And that's sort of different how I recorded with other people who might do like a couple lines at a time. But Oscar really, I think you took them as you were performing them. Straight through. The, inter the interesting with singing for the black tape was that the style that I sang with you is a, is not the style that I sang with my own bands because my own bands tended to be more rock. With black tape, I could be more I don't want to say over dramatic, but melodramatic. I don't know, but whatever it was, I I could I liked that aspect of it, and it was and it was a situation where I can I can you know put that side of my singing style in, into play. Whereas with my other bands, I, you know, it was always rock. It was more rock. So it, it was more interesting doing, you know, that was a different aspect of, of my singing. And I definitely knew you could do that, which is why I would write it that way. You know, the hypocrite yeah. is me is lyrically very melodramatic. Yeah. yeah and I, and I, I th there's a, there's a line, there's a, that category song, the hypocrite is me. There's scream my shallow, the hypocrite is me. And, and which is the one on, on, uh, Remnants of a Deeper Purity, the long one. For You Will Burn Your Wings Upon the that, Sun. Those three to me are that type of like really melodramatic, really. And I love singing those kind of songs because it's like, okay, here we go. I don't care. I'm just going to belt this one out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. And I, I do think sonically there's a similarity. Yeah. With the horn sounds probably. And, yeah. but yeah, For You Will Burn Your Wings is just so dramatic. And I, we did that one live at the fest, I'm sure. Yeah, we did that one live. That one came yeah. off really well. Yeah. yeah. And I do feel like there's sort of like certain styles of song, Bastille Day and Could I Stay the Honest One are similar styles of song and they finish albums. And mm -hmm. so to me, it does totally what you're saying. I, those are the connected ones. And what I like about Chain of Colors, for example, is it's, it's the one really song that's kind of totally different from everything else on that album. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a it's a piano ballad basically is what it comes out to and i think it's a it's a nice spot because it's like second to last so it's kind of like okay now we can breathe <laughs> mm -hmm. and then we'll finish the record you know i was going to ask that question too and that might be your answer too oscar out of all the songs that you had sung on that record which one really stood out to you as your personal favorite well chain of colors a hypocrite mm -hmm. is me definitely and I think on that album is the first time that I actually contribute a, a melody, which was Pandora's Box. Because mm. um, Sam didn't have a melody for that, so I kind of came up with it on the, uh, on the spot. And I was, at that point, I was discovering my Spanish roots and Sephardic music, and so I kind of put a little bit of that flair into it. So that one, that one sticks out, too. Mm -hmm. and, and Sam, for you, what's one of your personal favorites on that record? Yeah, I mean, Pandora's Box was sort of the follow-up to Across a Thousand Blades. And so it was, I guess, trying to write more like a traditional song structure. You know, musically, it was trying to do things that I probably hadn't tried to do, really. Because Across a Thousand Blades had that sort of ambient break in the middle, which made mm -hmm. it not, not really pop song structure. And um, I, I just, I saw some review that said The Hypocrite of Me is is the centerpiece of the album. And I maybe didn't think about it at the time, but I see where it builds up to that peak. And then it goes into the two <laughs> songs that Vicky plays that are the sort of ambient, where instead of vocals, the violins are the melody and the violins are sort of the personality on those two songs. So it, it has those two sides, the vocals, but also that instrumental section. And like I said, it was very, where I was at was very sort of dark and angsty about relationships. And so the album has that darkness through a lot of it. Change of Color, I think, has optimism. Does, does it, would you call it that, Oscar? I think so. I mean, it builds up to a crescendo that has, it's kind of like light coming in. That's what it sounds like to me. 
And was Vicky, was that the album, the first album that Vicky played on? Yeah. Yeah, and she was she was a fine because and she later on played in other albums. She had an Indian classical background. I mean, she was a phenom- she's a phenomenal player. And I ended up using her on one track for for my old Duende album, a Sephardic song. So that was that was a major fine having her. Yeah, her. she um, was classically trained and then she really got <laughs> sick of being in the orchestra and went to India for a while to mm-hmm. uh, get that side of it. And like I said, she played on a couple slap records. Which, you know, some of them are on, I put on Spotify, but her parts are just really good in this sort of dark electronic music. Mm-hmm. And so the two, those two that she plays on are in the vein of slap, maybe. And then later there's on um, As One of Flame, she has some very pretty melodic stuff on Given. And, you know, she just added a lot to the band to have a, I mean, hope I don't, forget some of it, but Vicky was the first really talented musician to play in the band where their music parts really stood out. I think on the albums before that. Yeah, she was actually classically trained. Yeah. Yeah. And and kudos to her for playing so different t- different types of music that she would play with slap, that she would play with black tape, that she would play Indian classical, that she could play classical. And she was open to all of it. And she had her own records too. I think she has maybe five or so. Records. Yeah. So yeah, she, she recorded with her husband, right? He played tabla, so he played on them, but they weren't collaboration albums. Uh huh. She played with a number of other musicians from Miami too. And Sam, because you were you're always so close to your fans, right? To people who are into your music, and you interact a lot with your fans. What do the fans think of Chaos's Desire? You know. W- w- Chaos of Desire. What do they think of this record? Have they shared anything over the years with you about what they love about it, and why is why is this record important to them? Yeah, I just posted something about it on Facebook today, and one of the people's comments was, "That's your favorite album," you know. And it with early albums, especially people, they discover the band and they fall in love with that moment in the band. And so, Chaos was the up to that point, the most successful album from Black Tape. So it definitely got out to a lot more people than previous ones. It was the second one on CD. And it, um, I think people really connected sort of to the emotionality of it. When I read the old interviews, so much of it is asking about the feeling and the con- concept. You know, they just really connected to the passion that came across through the vocals or through the music. What were you going through at that time? Because it sounds like there were a lot of things that may have been going on. And, and, and But when we first interviewed, too, you also mentioned that sometimes you aren't always writing songs necessarily just about yourself, too. So was this a lot? Was, it, was this a real personal album for you? I think the first four albums are very much personal. I think then I started doing more songs that might deal with not me topics but it was really uh i don't know now i would say immaturity in a way not not seeing hey this relationship just isn't working this isn't working you just gotta move on so there was a lot of obsession and there was a lot of trying to make things work that shouldn't and so a lot of it is about betrayal and losing faith and losing trust and dishonesty and um I guess it's interesting how this sort of basic thing that we've all gone through is turned into these poetic lyrics that still stand up, that still work. You know, what Oscar's performing isn't just about that little relationship that didn't work. It it has its feeling that carries through still. And um, talk about the hypocrite is me. It's just like realizing, oh, I feel this way. I want to do this thing, but I can't do it. And then I just betray myself. You know, and that's what I sort of realized when I looked at the interviews like a year later. Oh, wait, that person didn't betray me. I betrayed me. I didn't just do the right thing at that point. So I think people connected to that kind of feeling. And as a, as a singer, the interesting thing is that I had to be kind of an actor, too. So it was like a pretend it was like a little play and, and I'm filling in the Sam's role and I had to act out the part that he was trying to express. So it's not just singing it, it's acting it too. 
you know, even though it, it wasn't something I was going through, but I have to get into, into it, what he's going through. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the thing about people perceive bands as the lyrics are the expression of the singer's emotion. Where in your own bands, Oscar, you wrote the words, you were expressing what you wanted to. Yeah. So I think people hear the album and if they don't have the liner notes or whatever, they assume, oh, this is what Oscar is feeling in this song. Yeah. So, you know, it was very fortunate that I had great singers who could translate that, you know, could bring out what I was trying to say that way. And Oscar's voice was so powerful on those songs. Oscar, where did you find that in your side of you uh, to bring to bring those songs to life? You know, where did you find that? Because again, they weren't your lyrics, right? So, where did you find that to 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 bring that and uh, to really put all you had into those songs? I think uh, it's. Ba I mean, the inspirations I have, the singers that inspired me. So I, you know, as a, David Bowie, he was. An emotional, really powerful singer, uh, Peter Murphy from Bauhaus. Um, I mean, those were my influences, and I, it was kind of in a way, okay, so how can I get a little bit of that into the, you know that kind of flavor, and you know, the kind of you know the, the theatrical thing. So I've always liked that aspect of it. I've I've never been one of those you know that believe oh you should you know tone it down. It's like you know if you got to do it over the top, do it over the top. I mean, <laughs> especially yeah. if you're trying to express these kind of emotions. As you say, over the top worked in black tape for a blue girl where it might not work in another band. Correct. Correct. So, I mean, if you're going to be singing these kind of lyrics, you can't just, you know, be kind of wimpy about it. You kind of really dig in. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that is one Bowie-esque quality about you, Oscar, is you can be a chameleon in that sense where so many of your bands that you've been in, they all sound different. I mean, yeah. I would say the closest to your style on black tape is Sleep of Reason, uh, but all your other all your other bands are just they're so different. And I, well, it, I mean, it was that singing in Sleep of Reason that Sam first heard, so that's mm -hmm. that's what he liked that song. Yeah. Well, and that's right because also your other bands were after this album. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Inter actually, now that you mention it, yeah, it was four bands after the Sleep of Reason before I ever be had another band. So it was all that's the sound that you had heard. That's before album. Yeah. 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 Right. So and at that point, I mean, the black tape were getting out further than the Sleeper Reason had just because of, you know, CDs coming along and everything's getting music out more. Right. You know what I find interesting is that these reissues, it's, it's such a strange thing that vinyl has made the comeback that it has, that you're putting out albums that first came out on CD onto vinyl. That's like if right now we reissued everything that first came out on DVD on VHS, which of course is never going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> but that an arc, almost arcane format is now the favorite, and that everything that was first, that you know, that now you have to get artwork that was this big before, and now have to think, you know, back to being big again. Mm -hmm. I think it's cool though. I mean, I, I think I think I, I'm I'm embracing it for sure. Well, Ashes in the Brutal Air was going to be on vinyl until very near the end because. That's why it, it's the length it is. It was designed mm -hmm. to be the two sides of an LP. And so Chaos is going to have to be a two LP because it's 67 minutes long. So what about long. Mesmerize? Are you ever going to, because Mesmerize was on vinyl. Are you ever yeah. going to reissue that? I, that, you know, I was thinking about that because that, that, to me, that and Chaos are somewhat musically, they fit together better than Ashes and Chaos in my mind. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I was just thinking today, Mesmerize would be really nice. Um, I, you know, I dig around to see if there's anything left over mm -hmm. and i don't know if you remember oscar but the lp and cas cassette of mesmerize had a different picture on the cover and a different mix of uh oh great what's the name of the song the sod of scatter i think mm -hmm. yeah the mix was like something like the, the band was way too far in front of the vocals or something on the original so mm -hmm. but there's not like many leftover unreleased tracks like ashes had but i i do think um yeah, Chaos has to be two LPs. And style-wise, the first four albums, I mean, as far as the cover is concerned, had a thematic look, which is always this dreamy female. <laughs> uh huh. You know, uh, it was it was almost like like Roxy music albums that they always had the woman on the cover. You know, so it had a cohesive look. Yeah, and they also do all of them. They the photo in a frame. Right? Yeah, the photo in the frame. 
that 80s photo in a frame book, sure. Yeah. So this new one you have coming out of the cleft serpent, it's the first time with a male on the cover and it happens to be you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there was a remix album, Tenderotics, that I'm on the cover too. Oh yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. But that kind of came and went quickly. <laughs> and I was showing this to Oscar earlier, which is, this is like lyrics for Pandora's Box that are probably the lyrics Oscar was holding when for, they were set up when he was recording it. I was going through one of my folders and found it. and. I, I was trying to find if I could find all the original lyrics because on later albums I have all the versions of songs, but I can't find uh, can't find any of the early albums original lyrics yet. And that's one of the nice things about what you do when you do reissue these albums on vinyl is you include a really beautiful insert booklet with all kinds of photos and liner notes. Now, what's to come for the reissue of Chaos of Desire? Yeah, so oh, I don't have one in front of me. I made a like a 20 page fanzine basically for Ashes that had old interviews from the time, whatever old photos I could find and also some current reflections on the album. And so for Cast of Desire, I'm, I'm starting to work on the same thing. Sorry, digging up the old interviews and the old reviews that were around at the time and then try try to have some reflections about it. And um, it's got it's. I mean, you know, you know the delays with vinyl, but it's hopefully going to be out before the end of the year, before October, before the fall. It, you know, I want to get it out as soon as I can, but everything is so slow getting LPs made nowadays. Um, but it's going to be two colors. I, I, I'm thinking about the two discs being different colors, just trying to figure out which blends to do for it to make, you know, it look really nice. And it's also the vinyl now sounds so good. I, I have this. I think it's Aladdin Sane on vinyl, and it sounds like the, the metal had worn out like weeks before they pressed this record. It's so <laughs> thin and shrill sounding. But now the LPs I get back, you can AB them to the digital files. You can't tell the difference on them, except for when there's a pop. Other than that, I mean, they sound so warm now. So they're going to sound good when it gets done. What's the timeline on getting the test pressings? Well, uh, um, they say they're going to press in June, but that that never really works out that way. So right. I, I don't, I just find I, I say a date and it, it's always later. So I'm saying October just to keep it. We're going to hit October, I hope on it. And is it similar to the other ones? Is it like a, like a gatefold sleeve? Um, I don't think it's going to be gatefold just because it didn't have really any extra imagery in it. Mm. You know, um, the cover of A Chaos of Desire is from the same photo shoot as the cover of The Rope, which was actually a video that I shot. And it's a different period, different part of the same videotape. And I have the beta, beta max tape still I can transfer and see if there's any other interesting images on it. But the booklet was mostly the lyrics back then. And, and now they're so tiny that I'm going to make the words bigger anyway so we can read them. <laughs> so, so yeah, so I don't, I, and also gatefold costs like, extra eight hundred dollars to make and i i want to keep the goal which i think it's twelve thousand dollars is the goal to make this thing so i'm trying to keep it as reasonable as possible every little bit adds more and more to the final oh, yeah. number <laughs> for sure <laughs> it's crazy so the other participants on the album what are their thoughts on the fact that you're reissuing this um i i i i guess they're uh, what's the right word? Um, Vicky, Vicky doesn't really work on music anymore. So Vicky is happy that, you know, it's still around and we're still, you know, caring about the work she played back in the day. And I just got back in touch with ja Jenna and, um, you know, she's interested in what's going on. We haven't really been in touch at all. And then I just found out today that Juliana passed away a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. so someone told me on Facebook, it was something I didn't know until now. So, I mean, I, I, Oscar has been in the band, out of the band, played again on an album in 2016, right? Yeah. So, you know, I, I've sort of kept it together, kept it going forth. So it's great to like be doing this. I mean, I don't think Oscar and I have seen each other, what, since a few years? 16. Well, yes. we had release. <laughs> so, and actually, that was the one time the band was in the same room was when you and Danny and I were all recording. Yeah. And we actually, at the release, yeah. Uh, yeah, we we did that little uh, 
to the Sky Blue Rooms that Danny and I did. That was like the one time, you know, three band members in the same room <laughs> in front in front of people. Uh -huh. Except for, I mean, the different versions of the live band over the time, but yeah, yeah. quite often the live band wasn't people who performed on the records also. So there were, you know, but not, you know, I think it's, I think it's great that there's still people interested in what we did 30 years ago, you know, that's really nice. What studios did you use to record this album? So I recorded a lot of it at um, Walter Holland's home studio, which was Tangerine Studio. And then the Oscar and Vicky were both recorded at Natural Sound in Miami. And then I recorded. Oh, wait, and, I'll, and also Juliana came out to Orange County to record because she was in Tucson at the time. And then I recorded Kim Pryor sings a little bit of backing vocals on one song and Melinda plays some clarinet. And that was recorded at a studio in Davie called Gled Sounds, which I, I only know because I looked at the liner notes. I don't remember. It. Oscar, did you ever meet Juliana before in person or just uh, no? No, no. The only singer of the main singers I met and we actually performed together was Lucienne. Um, uh, but Juliana I never met. How did you meet Juliana? So I think it was from her sending me an LP for the mail order catalog. Because she wanted to be on, on your recordings? No, I think that she wanted me to distribute it through the mail oh, order. Okay. That's my yeah. guess. She and her husband ran a record store in Tucson. And it's also possible I contacted them about stocking records. I really, I don't, I don't know now. Um, and Juliana was on this album, then she wasn't on two albums, and then she was on um, as one of Flame Laid Bare by Desire that came out in 99. And she, she played a really a, beautiful voice, a really like smoky, mm -hmm. pretty voice. Uh huh. And she played at the 98 Project Fest with the band. We were a three piece, Lisa, Juliana, and I. Uh huh. And then we did some shows <laughs> together. But yeah, I think that, like I said, I think Sue Kenny Smith's voice is very different from Black Tape for Blue Girl. Her songs are more folky in a way where mm -hmm. Juliana fit into this sort of the dark wave, dark sound of this album. Yeah. I would completely agree. Uh, and Sam, with her recent, you know, with you finding out recently about her passing, was there any memory of her that really stands out to you that you wanted to share today on the on the podcast? I remember, and this is a little bit more about As One of Flame, just the way she would layer vocals and the harmonies she would just sort of come up with to layer with them that just, you know, ungiven off of that. It's just, it's very rich the way she would create that. You know, I think, I think I was still on eight track then. So I was still limited by how many tracks of her vocals we could record, but you know, it, it made these nice layers. It's nice, you know, wall of vocals. That was really pretty. Yeah. And I mean, I think, and, and just like with Oscar, it was, it was the ability to record stuff quickly and not, you know, need a hundred takes to do it, but could like hit the notes and do the recording. It was really, you know, and hit the spot where the vocals go, which is not always easy in my songs because they don't have the obvious drum beat, you know. So it was really good to be to work with people who, you know, could take this sort of not as easy to follow in traditional song structure and do the pieces. Was it like that with Vicky's parts for the violin as well, where everything just kind of came together? Vicky improvised everything. Vicky would play a part and it would either be like, oh my God, or oh wow, you know, it was just like unexpected. And she would just play this thing. And sometimes, and also once again, limited to eight tracks, it couldn't be like, let's try something different because then you'd have to erase that one you just did. So there's one point in, um, I'm not sure if it's Hypocrite is Me, where there's a, a transition between two tracks, but Almost always it was first or second take of something that Vicky just did, you know, that became that melodic part around what existed. Yeah. And yeah, just working with talented people is so nice. Just being able to get a performance on a track. It was like everything aligned really well. All the players that you had on the board just kind of came together real beautifully. And it's just a it's such a I mean, it, it, the album's like a work of art. I mean, it really is. It's just, 
it's got that real nice classical vibe to it, but also dark and, uh, you know, black tape for a blue girl vibe, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, so for those that aren't familiar with the whole Kickstarter campaign, you know, talk a little about that, you know, why Kickstarter? I know you've done them previously and, uh, what is it about Kickstarter and, uh, what should people expect when they get a chance to donate to the campaign once everything gets launched? Yeah, I think that in the old days, this album, I think, sold like 7,500 CDs or something like that. And in the old days, you could put out a record and get it into stores and people would buy it. But you didn't really connect to those people because they were just people out there somewhere buying a record. And with a Kickstarter, each individual person is helping to make the album happen. And I, I've started emailing with so many different people who came back to the band or came to the band for the first time through a Kickstarter campaign. And you kind of, you, you I re-meet people who maybe were fans in 91 or in 86 who maybe drifted away or maybe just didn't know, hey, I could actually communicate directly with this band and talk to them. So it's nice to meet these different people that I now know this guy in Portugal who's like a really big fan or this guy in Italy or um, this guy named Eric, I think in Connecticut, who this is his favorite album. And I, you know, I know that and it's great to, you know, know who is really engaged in loving what I've done. So I like that about the Kickstarter. And um, the process is there's about a month in which funds are being going, people commit to their funding of the album. It's only charged if it makes the goal. So it has to reach the goal to cover the album. And it's, you know, it's sort of a month of engaging with people and promoting the record. And I do, I do like that process of, I got to do this. I got to make this happen. I can't like procrastinate. You know, I can't wait for the record to come out. This is what's going to make it happen. So not every artist likes that. It's sort of like, you know, you got, you got to work it. You got to push it. And some people don't like asking that directly for money to make art happen. But I think always as artists, we're asking people to help us make art happen and help us be part of it. Even, you know, they're coming to a show, they're helping make that happen. And they get to experience it and you as the artist get to perform it. But, you know, we're all part of the process. With the other albums that you've done Kickstarters for too, uh, in terms of just your overall satisfaction with how things kind of played out, uh, what were your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I I think the process is great. I've I already have all the experience of making the record and manufacturing from running the record label. So people know if if I get to the goal, I'm gonna make the record. It's gonna happen. I think some other some other people have complained about times that they don't get the end thing that they backed and they're frustrated by that part of the process. But with I don't know, this is the twelfth or thirteenth Kickstarter I'll do. So it's sort of become the process by which I can do these deluxe editions of the records. And it's, you know, I enjoy it. Yeah. And for this one, I, I, I've made a video for the track Beneath the Icy Flow that by the time this interview is up, I think it will be posted. But I, I went to school for TV film. So, it's, uh, you know, it's nice to be able to make videos now. I use, there's different stock footage companies you can get from. Um, I wish, I wish we had made videos in the past. But once again, it's the problem of we weren't in the same place. You know, it just was, wouldn't have been easy. But, um, you know, it's sort of a chance to make some videos too, for the record. So, you know, for you, you know, with all the bands that you have been in over the years, you know, having a lot of your records put out on CD and cassette long before there were ever things like Kickstarter, you know, what are your thoughts on this entire process? On the Kickstarter process? Yeah. I think it's fantastic. I wish that Kickstarter had been around when the Sleeper Reason was around. <laughs> Yeah, but I think it's fantastic, and it really is a way of engaging with with the fans. You know who's buying the albums; they feel committed to it. Um, it's it's funny because when I, th I think I may have mentioned, maybe I didn't mention it in my interview with you, when I had Halo, my my wife actually had a sort of Kickstarter idea. We were had just recorded our second album. We had no money to release it. We didn't know what we were going to do, and she said, "Well, why don't you like get sponsors and see if they'll pitch in." And that's what we did. And we actually got sponsors and we listed them on the back and we had a release party and we, you know, we gave them copies of the, the CDs and t-shirts and stuff. So that was like an early Kickstarter. If only we had just 
know, <laughs> monetize that and made it a thing. Right. Who, knew? Who knew? But yeah, I think Kickstarter is a great thing. And Sam's been very successful at it. And are there any thoughts or potential ideas on doing a release party once this album is finally finished on vinyl? It is a thought that we've had it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I've been just so kind of isolated during the pandemic, not really going anywhere or doing anything. So it, it, it wasn't. I don't even know where we'll be then. Hopefully there's an end in sight so we yeah. can get back to that type of stuff, you know? <laughs> the yeah. endemic. When when does the endemic start? <laughs> I haven't been back to Florida since right before it started. So, yeah, it's been a while. Is that kind of what your idea would be to go down back down to Florida and do something down there? Well, Vicky's in uh, North Carolina now. So, mm. yeah, I don't know. It's, it's Everyone's just spread out. So... Someday I'm going to go back, <laughs> yeah. go visit. But, but I, I, I mean, I kind of, I was saying the first four albums to me are kind of a unit, and then I see the period when Oscar was in the band as like the early era of the band, and then there's sort of a middle era, and then there's the current era of the band, and um, there's so many, there's so many different people who've been involved over the years. But I definitely think Oscar's vocals and Oscar being in the band is one of the main things people know about a big chunk of the band's history. On the Wikipedia en entry, didn't somebody divide it that way by the Oscar era, the post-Oscar era, and then the other era? I was like, Yeah, but I think that update ended sort of when Ethan was still in the band, so it doesn't include, uh, like, you you returning and playing on um, these fleeting moments. Uh, so, yeah, so I, I need to get that updated by somebody someday. But, yeah, I mean, four, five... Were you on? I think you were on the first six albums. Oh, and then you were on a flame some too. So maybe the first seven. Yeah. And now the new one's the 13th album, I believe. Wow. 13 yeah. albums. <laughs> but also, I mean, the first four albums came out over the course of five years. So they came out really fast compared to later where there might be five years between albums. So I was looking at the Wikipedia page for Black Tape, and it is still broken out with the Oscar Herrera era from 1986 to 1999. Is that correct? Because, you know, Wikipedia is sometimes not always correct. Is that accurate? That is accurate until 2016 when I came back for that one album. Sam, do you know who was the one that put the Wikipedia out there in the first place? No, I, I, I know they do not like me editing it. That's what I know. <laughs> so I need <laughs> what to do you know about the band. Why should you do, get to edit it? <laughs> yeah, you know, and they Wikipedia really looks for facts, and facts exist only on the internet. So facts that exist, like I have it in my hands, don't count. Mm -hmm. So I need to find someday an editor who would actually work with the band on it to fill it out. Um, but I mean, I know other bands who don't even have. Their Wikipedia page gets taken down because Wikipedia decides they don't need one. <laughs> so, and also, I think so, I think Jana might have a page in Germany, but not one in America. So there's there's weirdnesses about it. But one of the reviews that's on there is to allmusic.com, and it talks about Oscar's delivery of lyrics in a deep self-loathing with command what is yeah. that <laughs> oscar were you were you aware of that <laughs> i think i did read that yeah self-loathing i love that well <laughs> I, I there there's a line hypocrite of me emotionally impotent um my words for turn shards and fall emotionally impotent is from a review from the la weekly where they said that the characters are emotionally impotent they were talking about ashes and i was like oh that's that's harsh. And so that's a harsh thing to say about somebody. So I thought that's a great thing to throw into a lyric. So um, I, I do think, I don't know, did, I don't think I personally felt self-loathing that I thought I projected out to people I knew in the time. But I think within the songs, there might have been some of that. You know, it's like, 
I remember Oscar being competent and prepared for what we were doing, coming to the studio and ready to go. But it's not like we spent a lot of time hanging out together where we really got to know each other. For Lush Garden, you came out to LA and we spent a few days together. But up until that point, it was almost like we spent time in the studio together and that was it. So I have, I really have no idea how I came across when we met in those brief instances. You did not come across as a self-loathing individual, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get that vibe at all. <laughs> yeah, it's it's just weird because like I asked my friends back in college and they were like, oh, you just seem really driven and determined. And I was like, hmm, I, I don't know if I can say that's how I would have described myself. No, yeah, I think that's pretty accurate, yeah. Now, Sam, one of your also longtime collaborators is also listed as contributing to this album, uh, Pat Ogle from Thanatos, who I have an upcoming interview with him this year on the podcast. So he'll be on for a one on one interview. But he played guitar and did some singing on How Can You Forget Love? So what are your memories of working with Pat as well on this on, uh, as part of the on the part of this album? Um, that was a sample from our first cassette mm -hmm. that I brought in and processed. So. Pat wasn't actually there or even aware of the song, I think, until it came out. <laughs> um, that was just actually because um, the very first song, These Fleeting Moments, is a sample of Sue from a song off of Ashes, I think. And it, it was just taking a very short segment and then using it as a, a building block to then put together the rest of the song above it. And so, you know, I, when I went back to the cassettes, I was like, you know, it had some name like Sue Song at one point, you know, just like Tear Love From My Mind was piano song for a long time. And so, yeah, you know, it wasn't like Pat came in and recorded for that. Um, on the Lush Garden, the one song, this Lush Garden Within was actually going to be a Thanatos song until I stole it and put it on the Black Tape album. Nice. So, um, yeah, I, I forgot when I mentioned people involved because Pat wasn't actually there because we didn't record. He came out to L.A. in 93 to record. So it was after this album. 92, I guess. Released in 93. So that's what's fun about doing these interviews. You get to learn some of the secrets on how it all came about, you know? Yeah, yeah and then I remember, too. About... <laughs> well, thank God that there's reviews out there, right? To help jog the memory. Yeah, yeah. To, to look through it. I, I, I just, you know... It would have been great if at the time we were interviewed together and we would have that to remember back on too about what we were feeling at the time. Yeah. And just speaking on that, was there any reason why there weren't really any interviews that kind of came about with more of the members of the project at that time? I would get interviews by mail or mm. later by fax. And so they were all written interviews. So they were not. And you can see, I can see the progress from like handwriting to my dot matrix printer or my typewriter and my dot matrix printer over the course of this album, you know, but um, yeah, it wasn't. I remember I did an interview with B-Side in person. I was working in Chicago, so it was probably, it might have been for this album. Um, when I was doing computer graphics, I was in Chicago and somebody from the magazine was there. But yeah, I mean, I, you know, unfortunately they, I, Oscar didn't get into the interviews or Juliana didn't get into interviews back then. I'm not sure, Oscar, besides the one Jeff's done, have you been interviewed about the band? Did we do an interview in Mexico City on radio that I had to translate? Um, you weren't at the interview with the clown, were you? Oh, yeah, I would have remembered that. Rosa. <laughs> I remember you talking about the interview with a clown. No, I, I was not there. No, so yeah. no. <laughs> Let's yeah, learn more about that. And what, talk about that interview. So, yeah, that's, that, that's Latin TV for you, interview with a clown. Yeah. Well, the, he was like the David Letterman equivalent. He was the late night host, but he would dress like a clown. And and he, um, I believe Mara, Elise, and I were all sitting in the chairs, and he would ask a question. I would answer, he would translate it, and everyone would laugh. And I was like, I didn't say anything funny. So I had no idea. I want to see the video of that interview and have someone actually translate what he said. Because I'm sure we, you know, we probably came across as like these spooky goth people, you know, all in black. And there was a, a, a band, and I think there was also a mariachi band who were like the performing band. 
but I just remember them doing their take over and over again, and our stuff kind of happening real quick. But Mara and I were also on like a morning TV show that Aldo got us on. And so I, I don't remember doing a radio interview, but it's totally possible. Interesting story. That's not one that came up when I interviewed the two of you previously. <laughs> I, want I, mean... the, I want to see the clown videotape interview. Yes. Somebody yes. must have it. There's something about clowns that just, you know, makes Creepy. something. <laughs> Creepier than black clad goth people, for sure. Nice. So in closing, I know we're we're uh, kind of wrapping things up. So, you know, just to kind of just close things out, I'll let, you know, just kind of pass it to each of you. Uh, any other memory or anything else you wanted to share before we kind of wrap things up here? So, uh uh, Oscar, you want to want to take us to that to that part? Um, I don't think there's anything that sticks out in particular, though. the The process was it always seemed to be very speedy. You know that we that would just just get in there, do the work, get the stuff out, and and usually I think we were both usually more pleased with the results. I mean, w- once we were done with it, and it was always a fun process to have like this sketch that Sam had put out and then to add to the sketch, you know? Um, but that was with every recording. I don't, I don't remember anything particular about this album, but that was in general, that's always been the feeling with all the recordings that we've done. That it was always a, a pleasurable creative process. And, and what did you say? It was maybe three hours in the studio, Oscar? Probably max. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Sorry. Let me interrupt. Just... No, that's all right. <laughs> Yeah, I just think that, I don't know, you, you read about a band going to the Bahamas to record for like a month to get an album done. And I'd done the work beforehand, but with each of the vocalists, it was like, just, you knew what to do, you knew what you wanted to do. And it was like, I think the one, that was the recording we had extra time at the end and we recorded one of your songs, you know? It's like, hey, we got what we need here in a couple hours. Yeah. You know, didn't have to keep working at it or there weren't a lot of, you know, conflicts about what to do with it, so. No studio tantrums. I've never had any of that. <laughs> <laughs> Throwing the cymbals or <laughs> microphone stands. Yeah, and I I then took it back. I was in Orange County then to mix it. And because when I look at what's on the tapes now, there's the one vocal track and maybe a few backing vocals. You know, we we had it done at that point when, when I came down to Miami to record it. And I forget now if there's four you have lead vocals and a couple backing vocals. Maybe it's five or lead. But yeah, we got we got it done in a short period of time, and it sounds great. You know, listening to the recordings now for the couple of tracks I mixed again, I often would bring out me so you could hear the vocals even better, and they sound great. What you did back then, it's exciting to have this album finally get released on vinyl. So, a lot more to come as the Kickstarter begins very soon right that's happening in early march is that right sam yeah it's going to start at the beginning of march run through the month i think it i think it's going to end april 4th the just okay. figuring out the exact dates now very nice and where can people get the latest updates and that sort of thing yeah so i don't have the actual link to the kickstarter at the time we're doing this but black tape for blue girl.com will have the link on his front page mm-hmm. over to the kickstarter page and um, a lot of people just follow the band on Bandcamp these days. Mm-hmm. If they purchase something, they can follow there. Um, all the links are on blacktapeforbluegirl.com to the different spots where they can follow. Good deal. Well, it's been wonderful having you both back on for this ex- YouTube exclusive to talk about Chaos of Desire. L- looking forward to that getting released on vinyl for the first time. And it's just been wonderful to chat this this evening and uh, looking forward to the release. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you so much for bringing us together for this.